Hi, folks. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Theo Gonzalez, and this is the third program of Heritage in Real Life, a program sponsored by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the National Museum of American History, and the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. This project received federal support from the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, which is administered by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. 
In the second half of the program, uh, please join us for a zine making workshop where you will get a chance to explore your story in the form of your own personal zine. This event is being live captioned. To access the live captioning, please click on the link uh, on the screen. And in this part of the program, we'll start off with a dialogue with our two guests. So tonight, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce first Malika Garib, who is a writer, journalist, and cartoonist. She is the author of I Was There, American Dream, a graphic memoir, winner of the 2020 Arab American Book Award. The memoir chronicles her life and identity as a Filipino Egyptian American. It was named one of the best books of the year by NPR, the Washington Post, Kirkus Reviews, and the New York Public Library. By day, she works on the NPR's science desk reporting on global health and development topics such as humanitarian aid and gender and income equality. She also writes for NPR on her experience as a child of immigrants from talking to her Filipino mom about mental health to hosting an Eid Fest for her Muslim father. Garib is the co-founder of the DC Art Book Fair and the Runcible Spoon, a zine about food and fantasy. She graduated from Syracuse University with a dual major in magazine journalism and marketing. Let's welcome Malika Garib. Hello, everyone. Um, thank oh, you so yeah. much, Theo, for the lovely welcome. And thanks for letting me be here. Of course. Um, our second guest is Angel Trazo. She is a Filipino-American artist and scholar based in the Bay Area. She's the author of We Are Inspiring, the stories of 32 inspirational Asian-American women, her debut children's book, which she self-published in 2019. An illustrator and comic artist, her work has been published in PBS SoCal and scholarly journals such as Intersections, Critical Issues in Education, and ASAP Journal. Angel also works as a visual note taker, documenting events live through her notes and doodles. Trazo is currently a first year PhD student in cultural studies at UC Davis. She received her master's in Asian American studies from UCLA in 2020, and her bachelor's in biology and studio art from Colgate University in 2017. Let's welcome Angel. Hi everybody, so nice to meet you. So nice to see you, Malik and Theo. <laughs> All right, great to have you both. Welcome, welcome. So let's get started with some questions. I know folks are interested in checking out the zine making workshop that the both of you are gonna take us through. So that's gonna be really great. And of course, Filipino American history is so awesome that we decided we're just gonna keep extending it all the way through November. So um, <laughs> let's, just, let's just keep doing that, why not? Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in both of you in terms of, of thinking about your backgrounds as Filipino American women, as women artists, but then also thinking about the kind of style that you put through your work. So I'd like to ask uh, the both of you because you have this background coming from California, um, but at the same time, you've also been on the East Coast uh, for uh, certain parts of your life in Syracuse and Colgate. So um, I'd like to, to see if you can give some, some young folks advice if they're thinking about getting from one coast to the other. Uh, what advice would you give to young folks who are thinking about picking up uh, and heading to another part of the country? Who'd like to go first? Let's. Let's go with Angel first. Ah! <laughs> Let me just fix my lighting super quick. All I was right. like, nose goes, but I got called on. Sorry. Um, there we go. So I think I, I really wanted to try out seasons. I think that's how naive I was when I decided to go to college in upstate New York. Um, and I was like not anticipating the culture shock. So if you're from like, I'm from San Jose, California. So a very diverse Bay Area community. And then going to a very like predominantly white and wealthy institution was not something I was anticipating, but I imagined it like going to Gossip Girl school, but like Gossip Girl in real life and in college. Um, so Malika, was your experience pretty similar? Oh yeah, oh my gosh. I grew up in Southern California, um, very much like the Bay Area. It was super duper di diverse. And like, I grew up in a really Filipino community. So it, it was something really surprising to go into a different part of the country and see that it was not like that at all. Um, it was a culture shock for me as well. I would say um, the hardest part about leaving though was that my whole Filipino family, um, family and togetherness was really, really important. And for somebody to break away from the clan and like 
go somewhere else on the other side of the, the country. It was almost like a personal affront. Like mm. it just felt like to them that like, what are you doing over there? You have so many good schools here. Um, you're going to move away from your family. Like we all came from the Philippines and we live within five miles away from each other in Southern California. Mm. And, and here you are, we have this like new generation of children and they want to leave the pack. So yeah. they spent most of my, um, you know, most of my college and, my early twenties trying to convince me to move back home and like try to, um, you know, they still didn't really have that much faith in what my plans were moving out mm -hmm. to, to New York or moving to Washington DC, um, trying to be a writer, trying to be an artist. They really just, they didn't really understand until, um, until very much later in life. And I still had to kind of, um, believe in myself and and kind of not listen even though i really respect my family and what they think i just needed to like keep moving at and follow my own path um even though it was really hard and i was told several times look at your cousin francine she's a pharmacist and makes two hundred thousand dollars a year um mm. i've been told this even still like when i come home to christmas but you know it's never too late monica i don't want to be a pharmacist <laughs> <laughs> okay so can you can either of you talk about what what those conversations were like? I mean, without getting too personal into this, I mean, I, I hope you can personalize some of this because that I think a lot of us go through those kinds of questions where we're talking with family members, we're trying to explain a kind of world that we want for ourselves, and and sometimes we're assuming that that our parents have no idea what this is like, uh, and and the truth is they they actually do have an idea about it. Some it, it, because there's going to be someone in their family maybe cousins, brothers, other aunties that they had, and they might have been the artist. And probably one of the things they're trying to do is to kind of make sure that, that we're not gonna go down a, a certain path of, of disappointment. Can you, can either of you talk about what it was like to, to broach those conversations in your own families? We'll, we'll go with uh, Monica first on this one. Sure, yeah. Um, so, gosh, I think, I had to actually appease my family by doing this marketing degree in, in order to leave home, which is like why I have a weird marketing major. It's like, I just did it as like a, shut up, I'm doing business. And um, I'm also doing journalism too, which is what I'm pursuing. Um, it's really, um, it was, it was, it was tough. I think I just, my mom actually was, um, she always saw herself as the black sheep of the family because she got a divorce and she taught me a lot about being super independent and, 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 and I think that that's where my own independence came from. And it was really hard for her to convince the rest of the family that this is what my daughter wants. She wants to move away from home and we should let her have her try. Um, because many other matriarchs in our family, my grandmother and my aunt who's matriarch, they kind of overshadowed her own opinion. So mm. not to get too deep into this, but when I when I got married, um, I, me and my mom went to go buy my wedding dress. And then when they showed it to, we showed it to my grandmother and my aunt, they were like, no, it's so ugly. Go back to the store. <laughs> and they made me, they literally made me change oh what me and oh. my mom had chosen. Oh. Um, and that's just how our family is. So like, um, you know, even though I had my mom on my side um, and she believed in me, I, I just kind of had to, you know, do do my own thing. So it sounds like you and your mom were kind of cut from the same cloth. And yeah. it's, it was part of it was kind of you and your mom against the rest of the other extended family. Exactly. Uh, and that kind of dynamic. Mm. Um, yeah. Angel, how about yourself? What, what, how, how are you able to kind of broach those conversations in, in your own family? I feel like in the same way that Malika decided to show off a marketing major, I ended up getting a biology major. No, Angel, that's like so deep. I was in so deep. Like I was like, mm. even after I graduated from college, I was like, oh yeah, mom, I'll apply to like post backs in the sciences so I can work on my mm -hmm. MCAT. Um, but instead, after college, I applied to get my master's in Asian American studies. And then when I got mm. in, she was so surprised, but she was also like, so shocked that I got in and then she was able to brag about the fact that I was going to UCLA even though she still didn't really understand what Asian American studies was um but I think like that kind of convinced her she was like oh UCLA is funding you to go to school like that's exciting it's oh different um but obviously yeah. like 
Um, I similarly have relatives. Shout out to my cousins working at Kaiser Permanente, Stanford, nurses, <laughs> doctors, pharmacists. And then my cousins in the Philippines, they have a dentist, a dentistry practice, like that's one Nadella dentists. Um, and they take all these photo shoots looking like crazy rich Asians. And like, <laughs> you know, sometimes I re I'm like wondering, like, should I, should I have gone the medical or, you know, dental route? Um, mm -hmm because there's always like this element of risk that comes with going into the arts. And even now, um, especially looking at like the academic kind of hiring pool, even becoming a professor is very terrifying, um, a terrifying yeah. endeavor. So I think, yeah, it was definitely, it, it's still kind of like me trying to convince my parents, like, look, I'm doing something good. I'm making art and it makes people happy and it's sharing the Asian American experience or like their own experience. Um, yeah. And I tell them it's kind of like, Coco the movie, except instead of about like Chicano culture, I'm doing stuff for like Philly M culture. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah. I see. Culturally exciting visual art things. Um, but yeah, it's definitely still a yeah. strange dinner conversation. Like, oh, what are you up to? Are you still in school? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> you still, still in school? school. Uh. I'm still in school. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, yeah, I got, I did it the long way and, and uh, I was still in school for quite a long time. Um, but Angel, let me, let me follow up with you because, the, um, you know, choosing biology is, a, you know, it's a straight ahead, practical, tactical uh, uh, move. And yet, didn't you also choose uh, art as a second major or is it a, a minor? I, did. I, I was a double major, so I didn't uh -huh. And it was really scary. <laughs> but I also had friends alongside me at Colgate who um, were just as crazy as I as I was, except um, now they're doctors. They, they chose the other path. But they were like me, like staying up really late in the art studio while also trying to write microbio papers and stuff like that. So it was definitely like me trying to straddle kind of two worlds and two options. Um, and I feel like it was only after I graduated college and really set my heart to, you know, my kind of art, my scholarship and kind of melding those practices together and just going full force that, you know, you realize you don't have all the time in the world. And at least like in my twenties, I'm just going to explore this path of Asian American studies and like my scholarship and art in this way um, as much as I can. And I've realized like people tell me, you're going to get tired of doing art. Like you're going to want more stability. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you can't just live this dream forever. You can't be a student forever, but here I am in a PhD program and I still have five to seven years to go. So I think for now, <laughs> There's my 20s, just being a student and, you know, enjoying it. Does it pay a lot? No, but at least I'm not losing money. <laughs> I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's there's an upside. Um, and uh, how about you, Malika? What, um, can you talk about when, uh, do you remember the the first time you remember that that being an artist was was gonna be a, a real profession for you and, and, and not just a side hustle or, or was it something that was always with you? Yeah, um, you know, I um, realized really quickly as a young person that if my family would never accept me um, be, to be an artist that I needed to have a serious daytime gig um, and be committed to that and then just spend my free time essentially being an artist. Um, I've seen my family do that and hustle through it. I come from a really creative family. My um, my aunt, the matriarch, she's a doctor, but she is um, also a, a, a florist um, and a wedding wedding planner. And I know those things don't really mix, but she pursues, you know, outside of being the head of a hospital in, in California, she is, um, she's making flowers on the weekends and that is her, her other identity. And she mm -hmm. taught me at an early age that it's possible to be multifaceted. So um, if I, I like really strongly pursued a serious uh, career in journalism uh, and spent my whole 20s and early 30s and currently trying to like build a serious career, but I also knew that, that my time when I'm off the clock is also just as valuable into creating mm -hmm. um, the kind of person who I want to be. And as an artist, you're not really fulfilled if you don't create. So like you, mm -hmm. I felt that um, in my life in general, that that I really felt sad at the end of the day if I didn't have a chance to make something creative, um, uh, to, to have a hustle on the side. So I started, you know, I started a lot of side projects throughout my 20s. I started a, a food zine. Um, I started mm -hmm. a, um, an art event in, in Washington, D.C. I, um, you know, I started drawing comics uh, and, you know, I write for other publications. 
you if you can't get that happiness and satisfaction during the the day because you're pressured to do to not go to art school and whatever i mean like that's not the end of you you know you can still mm -hmm. have a life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and angel what's what's it like um for you as well when you kind of think about uh about this um this this chosen life you know being an artist it's not i guess it can be a job in one way is it you can treat it like a job uh and there are people who 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 uh, approach it that way um, but like in the way that that Malika is talking about, there um, there are ways that we that we fit creativity and uh, joy of of that kind of uh, of that kind of work wherever we can. And after a while, it's not just a hobby; it really becomes another part of your life, another way of expressing, another way of connecting to folks. How's that? How do you, how are you finding that now, especially as a full time student, where you're you're dealing with 12, 15 units, um, and and at the same time, you're you're keeping up a really active profile as as a working artist. Yeah, I think I couldn't have done what I do without, you know, the support of my community, honestly, especially like a lot of academics really like art and a lot of folks haven't been drawn before. So what I would do in college a lot of times is that I would, I, ooh, I have a sample. I would sketch during um, like events, like guest speaker events. And it was kind of my way of like being happy throughout the day, throughout a busy day as a student. But I would sketch like, this is when I made of Helen Zia at when she came to Colgate back in 2017. Um, and I would just share these on my social media. And I started like this art social media. Um, and I was like, I will have no followers on this. Like my art is so ugly. Like when I started out, um, when I was like 21, I was like, this is terrible, but I'm going to just put it out there and see if there are any takers. And now in 2020, I can say that, you know, I've drawn for folks at Harvard, UCLA, just like all across the country for different, um, even like um, nonprofit organizations are really interested in this way of capturing events live. So this kind of visual note taking side hustle has gone to something I would kind of do to network and slide into Helen Zia's DMs. Like, Helen, I drew you, <laughs> you noticed me. Um, now it's something that people will seek out you know me they'll be they'll slide into my dms and be like hey i'm having a book talk would you like to draw me um you know for x y and z commission and i'm always like oh my god you want me to draw you and yeah. you're going to give me money it it has literally been so fun and obviously the work is very sporadic um but you know the fact that i've i've been able to find value in my art and to see other people find it valuable and then like share my art on like twitter on instagram and be able to share like their passion for whatever they're researching um you know with my help in that visual way makes me so happy so that was like my ultimate goal and to see that coming true in these these side <laughs> projects like it's really been like a dream country like i'm actually like still so surprised that this is this is life you yeah. know so Angel, let me ask you about that because I, I think I first heard about, I first saw your work, I think in um, a conference and it might've been the American Studies Association conference, oh, yeah. probably in Hawaii of last year or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a, a panel of speakers. And you know, when I take notes at a conference, it's, you know, I'll, I'll write down the name of the person and then scribble a bunch of things and I'll never go back to it. But <laughs> but you're, you have a, a really distinctive way of, of, of creating these visual notes, uh, visual note taking and and when I saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, this this makes this panel seem so much more alive than um, than I remember it. But um, can you talk about how you developed that style of visual note taking? Because it's really dense. Almost every I don't know if anyone's seen this, but I mean every yeah, show, inch of the page. Show, show a picture. Yeah, can you put, can you um, show a, a, sure, an example sure. of that? Oh, that's not no, 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 not, not that one. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, oh, we're we'll talking for behind the scenes. Thank you, Manny. <laughs> no, no, Angel. <laughs> Angel, can you hold up like uh, the oh, Helen Zia thing? Oh yeah, I thought we were. <laughs> I was like, who are we talking to? Oh, I lost the Helen Zia. Oh, all right. You can see the first drawing I ever made in fall yeah, yeah, yeah. of 2015. It was not that great, but here, if y'all can Aww, see it. Oh, that's so great. Look at how awkward the back of this guy's head <laughs> is. Like, how <laughs> awkward are these little pictures? That's kind of cool. I like yeah, it. I love but that. We just start with like trying to do the presenter and then do some kind of quote and then whatever notes would just kind of be like on the top. And then it, it really developed yeah. into kind of like a comic book. So I found Helen Zia again. Yeah. So you wow. see the bubbles kind of being created. And this was all over the course of the months kind of documenting my own yeah. style changing, sometimes just drawing really freehand. Um, these are my friends when we went to like Portland, Oregon a few years ago. <laughs> so not necessarily all academic conversations. Um, but yeah, after a while, it became a lot more like trying to 
turn it into a teaching tool. So the notes mm. became kind of like a like a little comic story. Um, like you could follow along the bubbles and see like um, if you go to my Twitter, like the pinned tweet is about critical race theory, and then it kind of gives you a history of how like intersectionality and critical race theory was formed, just like in a matter of thought bubbles. And if no one's ever heard of that before, like, ooh, now they'll be interested to like look up the scholars in this drawing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's something that this kind of like accessible um, ethnic studies critical knowledge is something that I was so passionate about doing because when I went to Colgate, like ethnic studies, I didn't know it was a thing. Like Asian American studies, what is that? Like it wasn't until I graduated <laughs> from Colgate. It wasn't until like the month before I graduated this is why I have this prop, this prop back here. So when I grab, what but right before I graduated, I got a DM um, on my social media from this girl Katie Kwan, who writes this Asian American like comic book, and she was doing at the time her master's um, in Asian American studies at San Francisco State, and I was like, "You're doing a master's in what? That's the coolest field! <laughs> I did not know it existed. Um, I need to figure out what this field is." And I think that's what spurred on this perpetual studenthood. Um, and even like using these drawings, like it's definitely a way to make people who aren't students anymore excited about this kind of scholarship and like, you know, have their eyes open to what's going on in academia. Cause you know, it feels very constrained within the ivory tower um, mm -hmm. a lot of the time. So to get that knowledge out and about is definitely like one of the core roots of my art since I didn't get that when I was in college. Yeah. Well, I love how dense it is because you really pack a lot of information <laughs> onto the page, and it's like where's it's Waldo? A, yeah. yeah, it's it's really amazing. Um, so if if I can ask also uh, Malga then about about your style because it's um, it, what's what's fascinating is is your combination of text and images, and um, and if we could get that graphic up uh, of the image, uh, these would be pages from from your graphic memoir, uh, Malka. Could you talk just generally about how, you know, what goes into your thinking about putting together a layout like this? This is from, uh, I was their American dream. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I was a kid, I mean, I think it really comes from um, my love of magazines. I, um, I studied magazine journalism in college and really my artistry came from making zines and comics when I was younger, making my own newsletters, bulletins, um, memos. I had a lot of, um, I had, it was very highfalutin. I would just feel like, like a, a, a first magazine, issue number one by Malika Garib. Um, and I actually got the style from um, Amelia Tate, um, the Amelia's Notebook series. This is a childhood book that I had, but if you notice, she did this combination of text and um, an image. So it was almost like you were right. reading, reading her diary. And that's what I kind of wanted to create in my own art, a sense that you are reading a child's publication about, about anything that they wanted you to know about. So um, I kind of like this naive, kind of like very childlike looking um, style where it's almost like uh, a diary, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're peeking into, into somebody's intimate diary. So it's mm -hmm. yeah i i'm trying i want to get a, a, the runcible spoon oh yeah i have it so i have this zine the runcible right. spoon um which is a mix of collage and um text and basically like again like the, we kind of like this childlike ugly highfalutin style <laughs> where it's like full of jokes it makes no sense um it's like very homemade and homespun there's a lot going on, and um, yeah, I hope that answers yeah. the question. Well, yeah, there's what it reminds me of is that there's um, that there's a difference between like childlike and childish, and yeah. the, there's a real you know sense of empowerment when you're thinking about what what the child knows, which is they they know what what's funny, they they know what's immediate to them, what's important to them, and they don't care much for um, um, uh, for um, uh, for people trying to fake your head <laughs> in in different ways, and so it's it's um, it's a beautiful thing to see because both of you kind of have a um, a, a DIY spirit to your work, um, and um, and maybe we could uh, switch then Angel to your to your book because then it, it you know we think about the production of of um, of we are inspiring. You talk about what um, what it, why did you start that book and and what was the inspiration for thinking about a children's book of, for Asian American women. 
Oh my gosh. So it was the summer of 20, 2018, I believe, like after my gap year, I'd already gotten into UCLA and I had like, like two weeks before going to grad school. Um, and I just, I kept seeing this one children's book, which was like black leaders, like bold leaders in black history by Vashti Harrison. And it was an anthology of like amazing, like African-American and black women, um, like a whole history book. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like, is there a children's book? Like I asked the bookstore guy, I was like, is there a children's book like this for Asian Americans? And he was like, no. And I was like, why not? I was so <laughs> confused. Um, there were so many like feminist anthologies coming up at the time too. And I would flip through them. Yeah. Like, where are the Asian Americans? Like, where are the Pacific Islanders? Like, and I would only find Maya Lin, um, which is great. Like, mm -hmm. we love Maya Lin and yeah. I included her in my book as well. And or like Anna Mae Wong, and I'm like, okay, it's either like Maya Lin or an Asian American who's passed away long ago. And I felt really like confused yeah. as to why there wasn't. Um, an anthology that had more, you know, diverse Asian and femmes. Um, and so that was really the main inspiration. And so it was just like in a boba shop when I put this together, like literally in a boba shop with my old Wancom tablet from like 20, like from 2015 that I had since I was an undergrad, like just kind of doodling on this like tablet. And then you have to it like connects with the USB to your computer, doing like the art, um, putting these little bios together on like, like Adobe Illustrator. Um, and then I was like, let's start a Kickstarter and see if anyone will support this work. And when yeah. people actually backed the project, like that's when I knew this isn't just like, cause I really created it selfishly. Like um, in my head, it was the children's book that I'd always wanted um, to see growing up. And I was like, would anyone else be interested in this? And when people like random strangers, not just my mom and my relatives were backing the project, <laughs> that's when I knew like I need to keep printing out you know, these copies, all of it just comes out of my own pocket, you know, um, but it's just the joy of seeing people like when I take this book to like zine fest and then they'll be like, oh my God, like this exists. I'm like, yes, it exists. Do you want to read it? And then they're like, oh my gosh. So those kinds of exchanges and just knowing that other people have been waiting for this book too, makes me so happy. Um, yeah. So I'm glad I did it. It was like, it was like a spur of the moment kind of like project that you know, has been so formative and just being able to meet so many different people, connect with a lot of like schools through this book and like different museums have reached out. Um, and it's made me so happy to know that it's not just like my dream book, but other people have seen it as their dream book coming to life as well. Aww. That's great. Well, it's great to realize it, um, that there are folks out there who are not gonna wait for things to happen. You know, if, if it's something that you're you're thinking about and you realize that it's not on the market, it's not available, then, then we should try to get it out there however way we can. Um, so I wish we could talk all night because, um, you know, me, I can get paid by the word. So I'm, I'm happy to, to see the both of you any, any time I can. Uh, but we're going to be transitioning to part two of the program. Um, and Malika, before we do that, could you just give us a preview of what you're working on next? I know you're, you're working on, I guess the, is it a sequel to I Was There American Dream or is it a, a completely no, different No, I, I, I'm working on a, um, a new book. It's a coming of age story also like I Was There American Dream, but it's less about um, identity and more about um, what it was like to grow up uh, and spend my summer in the Middle East with my dad mm -hmm. and his new wife and my new siblings um, as an American and kind of just try to find my way and, um, try to fit in with my family in this context that I had no, no idea about. Um, so that's what it is about. I'm really excited about it. And it's coming out in 2023. You will forget it by Ooh, that time. But no, I'm sure. no. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I spent so much of this first book immersed in Filipino culture. And now in this next book, it's going to be like all Arab all the time. So Ooh, wow. Yeah, can't wait. Well, right. it's, it's going to be great. And um, please keep sending us updates on it. I think it's going to be really cool. So folks, um, here we go. We're going to go to the next part of, of tonight's program. And I can't wait. You got to get your materials together. You follow need a piece along. of paper and a pen. Yep. Piece of paper and a pen. These two are going to guide you through a zine. Um, I'll pop off, but you'll get a chance to see two great artists at work. So stay tuned for part two of our program tonight.
Hello. Um, hold on. I think I have to mute myself. Hold on. Is that working? Manny, can you mute me? Oh, okay, great. Um, hello. Uh, so welcome to this next section of the workshop. Um, over the course of 35 to 40 minutes, we are going to actually finish a zine all about your Filipino American family Ooh. history. <laughs> so me and Angel are going to lead you through a workshop on how to make this zine. Um, and literally all you need is a piece of paper and a pen. And if you want to use some coloring materials, go ahead and get that ready. Look at Angel's got her pens. Um, and I don't know if you know what a zine is. Um, maybe you don't. I'm going to give you a little bit of a show and tell to show you and what a zine is. Zines are one of my favorite artistic um, ways of expressing myself. As I showed you before, I had a zine all about food and fantasy. Um, this one was called Our Cheap Issue, and it was $700 um, that I charged for it. But no. I, gave people, <laughs> I gave people a seriously deep discount for it. Um, so this is just an example of one type of zine where you have like, this one was, is, was color. But there's also other types of zines too. Um, this one is a zine about Prince and his and the food lyrics that he had. So um, all the, the references to food that he had in his songs, and this was illustrated. It's a very special zine. And um, I believe they're out of print, so you can't get this. Um, there's also, uh, let's see. This is, this is what the zine that we're going to make today is, is called the, um, we're going to use the eight page mini zine format, which is basically one piece of paper. As you can see, that's been folded um, in a special way and it creates a zine. What's really, really nice about this type of format is that you can actually make several photocopies of the zine. So you can see this is my friend's zine. He made a zine called Patience. Um, and you can fold it up and give it to your friends. You can sell it. I'm actually selling this zine on behalf of my friend um, Jorge, who's in jail, to buy him a new um, computer for when he gets out. So this can be a really great way to like raise money, um, share information. I make zines all the time for my job on the science desk at NPR um, about the coronavirus or other issues. Um, and just some other sm some other small zine formats. This person, uh, his this artist is named Carl Cervantes, and he's a Filipino Filipino artist. And he doesn't use the eight page zine format, but you can see that he stapled it in such a way where um, you know, like he has different pages, like like a book almost, like a little booklet. So as you can see, there's like a lot of different sizes of zines. They're basically just mini DIY publications and they can be about anything. Um, this one's about being an idiot. This one's about Prince's favorite food. And this one's about food and fantasy. This one's about life in jail. I haven't folded this one yet. But um, today we're going to make a zine all about your culture. So what's really great about this is that we are all making this zine collectively together right now. Like in the next 30 minutes, we'll be finished with this zine. And I really, really want you guys to use the hashtag, you all to use the hashtag um, craft and Quentuhan and make sure that um, you use the hashtag so that you can see other people's work around the around wherever people have made the zine. Um, and then you can also win one of me and Angel's books. So that's really great. Um, we'll give you a personalized signed copy of our zines if you share your Filipino American history zine on the hashtag. So um, again, we're going to share the hashtag with you all on the, the chat, I think, or somewhere. Or Angel's going to write it down. Yeah. Um, right. So it's an N, not an and. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually go ahead and fold the zine. So um, if you can, get your piece of paper ready. 
And oh, if you can't follow along, it's it's kind of tricky. Um, Manny's gonna send you a YouTube video. Manny is our guy in, in behind the scenes, sorry. He's gonna send a YouTube video of um, how to fold an eight page zine. So don't worry, I'm actually gonna find that link now. How to fold an eight page zine, great, found it. Um, and we're gonna put that in the chat, so if you don't get it the first time, it's a little tricky, you can just watch the watch the video here. Okay, so you take this piece of paper and you're gonna fold it in half. Okay, the man you behind the curtain, yes. So then you're going to fold it in half again. And um, basically what we're doing is we're gonna walk you through what to write on each page. So don't worry about like, what is this magazine gonna be about? You will have some. Fold it again, so you have this. So one more time, Angel. And then you're gonna open it again. So you see you have your piece of paper. And fold it again naturally where it falls. And turn it this way. And this is a really important yet tricky stage. You're going to fold, you're gonna actually tear or cut. I'm gonna tear it because I, I like things looking a little ugly and DIY, um, hence why I left this in. You're gonna tear or cut from this point to this center point right here, okay? So make sure that the fold is on the top, please. So you can see, let's see. See how the fold is on the top here? The folded part is up. So I'm gonna tear from here to the center. You got it? Yes. All right, and then you're gonna open it up and then you're gonna fold it hot dog style and just kind of fold it, press firmly. So hot dog's like the long way, right? Oh, and you can use any, any size of paper. I'm using a smaller piece of paper because I like small things. Um, and then turn to the side and you're gonna kind of just like collapse it in on itself. So you see my eye? Just keep going until you kind of like have this shape and then fold it again to your final book shape, to this shape. Do you see it? Okay, I'm gonna do this one more time for y'all. Um, oh, great, thanks Haley. I'm gonna do this one more time for you all just so that you can see it again. So you're taking a piece of paper, you're folding it in half. Oops. Folding in half again, folding in half again. You're gonna open it back up, okay? And then you're gonna fold it in half. Make sure that the folded side is up. Tear from this point to this point, like that. Then open it up again, fold it hot dog style, turn to the side, and then collapse it into this zine shape. Um, again, if you didn't get it that first few times, don't worry, it's really, really tricky actually. Um, just go to the YouTube video that we shared and you'll be able to follow along um, uh, on how to make an eight page scene. Um, so basically what me and Angel are gonna do, or we're gonna guide you through what to draw on each page. So we'll give you about three to four minutes to, um, to write what you need to, to write. So I will um, share what, uh, oh actually Angel's going to share what we're doing on the first page. And we're drawing right. along, by the way, with you. Yes, follow along with us. You can use colors, you can use pencil. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all up to your preference. So what we're first going to do is create our title page. And I'm going to do like the very standard name. So I'm going to put my Phil Am history by Angel. Um, but Malika, what are you gonna title yours? Let's work um, on the pages. I wrote, uh, my old, my first practice version was all about my Filipino American family, but I think I'm gonna put, I'm gonna write, oh, look at my mom, she's really angry. Um, I'm not <laughs> gonna name my zine. I'm gonna name it Filipino people and me. No, that's a stupid name. <laughs> <laughs> I am well, Filipino, why don't you believe me? a lot of energy, Theo, come back, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. All right, so what am I gonna put? I'm gonna put, I'll put my my Filipino. Yes, I'm Filipino. Oh my God, I'm Filipino too. That's what I'm gonna name my, my Z. Oh, that's good. Oh my God. I'm Filipino too. 
My and then I'll have a subhead, my Filipino American history, my Filipino American story. My Filipino And I wish I did colors like you, Angel. Bye, Malphibity. Yay, a little person. Ha 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 ha. I like your handwriting. Oh, thank you. I just, I've been watching a lot of like, like calligraphy art on YouTube. That's where you learn it. That's where I've been learning. Really? My, like, penmanship. Oh, oh by Angel. I'm going to give shout outs to all the wonderful people on this. I hope that you all are doing it. Say that you're doing it with us. Yes. I just want to know, are you actually making the zine? And Say so in the comments. You got a hashtag that good old craft and Quinn two so we can see it. That's how we're going to see. I'm yeah. so excited. Shout out <gasps> to Barbara, Elisa, Eliza, Eliza, Elisa, Andrea, Haley, Andrea. Um, yeah, let us know. Let us know if you're making the zine with us. Chaotic energy. I love it. Ooh, love from Oakland. Yes, Bay Area. <laughs> oh, yay. People are making this with us. I'm yes. So I'm so happy. Are you doing this? I'm so excited to see your real zines, too. Like, tag us afterwards because we want to see them. I made them for myself for Philippine American History Month, and I was like, we should do this with other people. Right? I'm just using two colors. I can barely see it. Oh my God, I'm Filipino. I love, it. you know, Malika, I met you because of another Filipino. Did you what? know that? Who? My friend, shout out to Lauren Higa, who was at UCLA <laughs> with me. She was like, I can't attend this book talk at Skylight Books, but you know, you should go there and you should get my book signed. So when I brought a book to sign for you, I actually brought my friend's book. Oh, did you? <laughs> but you signed it. So I had to get her a new one. Oh my god! Also, I saw that Wu. He said hi. Hi, Wu. He. She's viewing from South Korea, but we met at Colgate, so that makes me so happy. I don't know what time it is over there, but Wu. He, you gotta tell Woo -hoo, me. Wu. Wu. He. Yes. Woo -hoo, yes. Woo -hoo. Also, I love that um, that that um, title, Isabel. That's a really, really good a good title. Um, okay, so we're gonna work on our next page. So the next page is this page right over here, as you can see. There we go. Um, and hello, Luis. Welcome to the show. Um, this, this is on this page. I want you to write, to answer the question and draw a little doodle. Where is your family from in the Philippines? When did they move here, and why? So you have about four minutes to um, make this page. It doesn't seem like a lot of time, but honestly, it's like just don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Just draw as you feel. You know. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna write, yeah. Ooh, calling in from Hawaii, love it. Hi from Mountain View. That's my partner right there. That's my boo thing, oh my God. <laughs> my so-called Filipino life is so good. Oh my god, these are so good. Um, why did they move here? I feel like I always forget. What was the question again? Oh, um, when did they move here and why? When did yeah, they move here and why? From, yeah, when did they move and why? Ooh, and I'm gonna do... Oh my goodness, these titles are so good. They really are. Bren, I thought you were from Boston. Ooh, I love your visuals. Is that like a sunset or a desert? Oh, and it's like it's like the beach. Oh. And I, my mom always talks about like be going to the beach as a kid, and my dad was like more of like a city kid. Uh-huh. Um, and when did they move here and why? Oh, they fell in love. Oh, that's a nice story. They were pen pals. No. Like, 
Yeah, their cousins were like, I think their cousins set them up or something, but they were like, y'all are gonna die alone. So you need to like write to each other. <laughs> Otherwise you're never gonna get married. Cause they were both pretty like older. <laughs> and yeah, and then my dad was moving to the US. So that is why we moved in like, my dad came in the eighties and then my mom followed. That's beautiful, man. Oh, man. I, always, I never know how to spell Philippines. Is it two L's or two P's? One L, two P's. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, I already wrote it. Philip. Yeah, look. Wait, three P's. That. Three P. Philip. Oh, my Lord. Theo, help. Help. <laughs> Theo, tell us. Google. Philippines, thank you so much. It's one L, two P's. There we go. Except for the beginning P. That's why it's. Yes. <laughs> oh. Did your grandpa dye his hair? Did my grandpa dye his hair? Yeah. No. I feel like my dad's side didn't. And yeah, I think my I think my grandpa on my mom's side, I don't know if he dyed it now that I think about it. But he passed away and his hair was still black. So oh, he I don't definitely know. dyed it. I don't know. <laughs> I never thought about it as a kid. Now I'm like, I'm gonna ask my mom later. <laughs> Okay, okay, and so yeah, I drew the beach area around Mindanao, the island my mom's from, and then my dad is from the Manila area, and yeah, they were pen pals. Do you want to share yours, Malika? Oh, I'm not done yet. Is, are, are we, is our time up? We have one, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got oh, the one minute. <laughs> I'm not done yet. You share yours first. <laughs> That's all I got. They, you know, but I saw someone else's parents were pen pals. I love that. Ah, the art of writing. My dad would just take quotes out of books and then my mom would be like, wow, that's so romantic. Because I don't know if my dad was citing his sources. Let's put that there. Wow, but that's really, I feel like Filipino men are like very romantic. So cute. Um, <laughs> now but, there's a side hair debate. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I wrote, um, my family is from Quezon City, Manila. They moved here in the early 1980s because they were afraid of the economic instability in the Philippines. Mm. This, this is my, this is Papa. This Marcos administration, who knows what will happen to this country? I love it. I love it. I love the voice too. Oh, Tata. Tata. I work for the Marcos administration. That's so funny. You know what's interesting? I call my grandparents on my dad's side Lola and Lolo, but on my mom's side, I call them Mommy Lol and Daddy Lol. That's oh my gosh. They, they would differentiate them. So when they say Daddy Lol, then, then I know it's my mom's dad. And then if it's Lolo, then it's my dad's dad. Oh, I, yeah, I don't know why our family doesn't, I don't call my grandparents Lolo and Lola. Um, that's. I don't, I don't know why we just call him dad, like father, which is like what Tatai means, right? Oh, that's, um, that's cute though. Um, Mad Madeline, you, your dad sounds like he's very romantic. And then Maria, Filipino men are vain. I really can't speak to that, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have our, we're moving on to our next page, um, just to keep this moving. We're gonna be drawing on this page. Right here. Um, Angel, is this your question, I think? Yes. Okay. So, where did your family settle in the U.S.? Or, like, what do you consider your hometown? You know, if you have moved to the U.S. I know there might be some folks watching from, you know, other places as well. Just draw, like, where your family is from, essentially. Yeah, the area where you grew up, basically. Where they settle in the U.S. and where you grew up. Also, um, yes, this is going to be recorded and put on the... I, like it'll be on YouTube and stuff, so you can find it there. Have you noticed I'm still decorating my other page? Because that's how I want to use it. When some, it's okay if you can go. You can go back and do previous pages. Oh yeah, of course. So where did my family settle in the U.S.? Okay, if people know what I'm drawing right now, leave it in the chat. 
because <laughs> it's a very like local icon, if you know what I'm saying. Let's see if people can like, I did say where I was from at the beginning, but if people don't remember, you can guess where I'm from based on these drawings. I guess it's too obscure, it's okay. <laughs> I'll explain it later. Yes, someone got it, the San Jose Sharks. Spot on. Oh my goodness, that is so funny. I feel like the hockey team isn't very good, but if you're from San Jose, like there has to be some kind of shark fanaticism within you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, is that mommy? Hi, mommy. Mommy, are you gonna draw a, a little <gasps> cartoon too? Comment, mom. Mommy. <laughs> oh, that's mommy. Mom. <laughs> yeah. That's so cute. Mommy, why did we um why did we move to to Southern California? Ooh, East Side San Jose. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, people with San Jose have like a weird amount of pride, I, I see. But we gotta remember, y'all, we're on a lonely land. <laughs> a lonely land. I know I'm taking a Native American Studies seminar this quarter, and it really makes me think about like the original caretakers of the land. So shout out to any of my native people out there. And I know there's like indigenous people over in the Philippines too. It's something I'm thinking a lot about more these days. Oh yeah. Right? Yes. So I got the trees, got the suburbs, I got the shark. And oh, I need to put some boba places. So one, I, grew, I told you I grew up in like a super Filipino like community. And one thing that I remember is that in the morning, all the kids had like Longanisa burps. Oh my God. From eating breakfast. And like, it was so nasty. That's but we all so smelled the same, like fried garlic, you know, fried spam. That's so funny. I feel like I actually lived like a, f a bit away from the larger Filipino communities. So it took my mom like half an hour to get to Seafood City. But we go there so much, like I thought it was part of San Jose, but it's really like in Milpitas. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> I don't know, I just associated with home. So I put a Seafood City in there too. All right, uh, how many? Oh, okay, so I wrote, um, we settled in Southern California in a city called Cerritos. Our, our fam, uh, let me hold it up. Can you wait? Yeah. Our fam wanted to be near a lot of Filipinos, and there certainly were. And this is me in school, in grade school, and I'm saying, every kid here smells like Longanisa. Oh, I, <laughs> there's little uniforms too. I love it. Uh, what did you draw? I drew the San Jose shark. Um, you know, we're in the bay, like in the valley, so there's always like these purple mountains. Um, the suburbs, I drew like a little hospital for Kaiser Permanente, which is like, like my aunt was a doctor. So we all came in through my dad's side, like through that empire of care kind of connection. Um, mm -hmm. Boba Shop, Seafood City, and of course, like Ohlone Land, just recognizing that, you know, this is their indigenous land. So yeah, that's where I'm from, 408. <laughs> I don't know why like people in the US love to use area codes to like refer to where they're from, but Oh yeah, five six two baby. I'll never lose <laughs> my area code. I love your drawing, it's so cute. I love it. It's so adorable. I'm I'm more I'm so text heavy. We have such different styles. No, I know our styles are so different, but like, you know, we are rocking it over here. I'm obsessed oh with like their little characters. Like it feels more like a like a comic book, and mine's kind of like a a <laughs> like a vomit. No, I love it. <laughs> Um, my, um, I, I agree, um, Haley, that Longanisa Burps would be a fantastic band name. Yes. Um, okay, so the next page that we're going to draw, we're already, we're already like halfway done, um, Ooh. really, is growing up, what were some Filipino traditions that were really important to your family? 
So you can draw this and express it in a multitude of ways. You can draw like a little collage of different elements. You could pick one. Um, just uh, just express by. Also, you don't have to do it in a in any format. That's you know like like ours. You can see that our approach is so different. You know, angels is so visuals oriented, and mine has a lot of text. If you want to like just go Jackson Pollock and just ex mm -hmm. express yourself abstractly. Go for that. If you want to, if you want to write a haiku, if you yes. if you don't even want to ask the prompt, then just draw a black dot as a symbol of um, I don't know anything. You can do that. It's all you. This is your magazine, your life, your book, your life. You know. Your book, right, your so life. Yes. My um my favorite traditions that were important to my family. Okay. Oh yes, this is a lechon over here. And this is me and my cousins like trying to fight over the crispy parts. Oh yeah. Um, I'm gonna draw, oh, I made a mistake, but that's okay, mistakes are good. I always like mistakes because it shows that it's real. Um, I'm gonna draw uh, about Noche Buena. Ooh. Did you guys see that that um, parole commercial for Disney? Like, was what was that? Was it Disney or something? Or was it like a what was that? I haven't. I'll have to oh, see. It's like such a tearjerker. It's British too, and I'm like, oh my god, I didn't really have British Filipinos. Just kidding. Oh my god, I know we're everywhere. Everywhere. Because where are you right now, Malika? Aren't you? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. If you can Ooh. believe it. Are you gonna get an accent? Um, I think I'm already starting to have like an accent. Oh I'm excited. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want one. My cousin has a Midwestern accent. She's been living in um, like Michigan for like ten years, and she has one. I was like, dang, maybe that's gonna happen to me. I don't know. I don't want one. I mean, <gasps> my mom said recently that I sound like a white woman, and I was like, what, <laughs> what are you saying to me, mom? Oh my gosh. I'm excited for your comics about Filipinos in the South. I'm ready. Oh yeah. I we, we have like we're like actually hanging out with each other. Um and we're we're doing like a little like food club where we like actually make food and meat and stuff. Oh because there's like a huge Filipino community here. I one thing I learned about being living in a place where there's not that many Filipino people is that you really do have to make an effort to like create community you know and find them and they and you will find them yes okay that's true you found us that's right oh, so cute. oh who's quia conrad hello quia conrad <laughs> Christmas Eve and New Year, right? That's right, mommy. And remember, Nanai always said that not to wear black for the holidays because she said it made us look morbid and sad. So she always wants to wear us to wear bright colors. Darren says that my parole lights give him an an aneurysm. Oh my god! <laughs> they're so twinkly. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, here we are. You're drawing. So oh. food. Are we done? Oh, one. Okay. Do you want to share yours? Oh, yeah, sure. So, some important traditions are fighting over the crispy lacon skin. <laughs> and during <laughs> my eight cousins in the Philippines and I would like exchange presents through Balik buy-in boxes. And of course, the holidays are coming up, so we can't forget 
all these angels that my mom puts around the house. Like, oh. why do you think she's an angel? Because she's obsessed. She literally, you know, like that one movie where that one kid has like a parent with a black Jesus question? That's like my mom with angels. I can't tell you the movie, but oh. like, are like my mom's thing. Everyone, we have like a, yeah, I don't know what my mom collects, but I'm glad that she collects angels because it means that she's thinking of you. Um, oh my gosh, Madeline, I thought that was my, just my family about the wearing black. That's Thank cool. you. Um, so here's my page. My family took Noche Buena really seriously. The house was decorated and we had pots of Aris Caldo on the ready. And here I am with my insane parole. <laughs> There we go. Also, this is a little um oh my god, so cute glossy look that I made out of clay. Okay, next page, Angel will present. Okay, so speaking of food, what was your favorite Filipino food growing up? Ooh. Mm. God. Let's see. Hmm. Okay, let's see if people can guess what I'm drawing over here. I feel like I'm doing Pictionary. It's so fun. Yeah. And people in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, your favorite food is Sinigang? <laughs> Happy birthday, Cindy Gun. That's right. Oh. Oh, what oh, I, I know the answer to yours. Um uh Angel. I'm not gonna say it so other people can guess. <laughs> I will have no more brown ink after this. Ooh, someone's guessing Champorado. Good guess, not quite. I don't even know if I can get. Oh yes, Bren got it. Did you go on? Mmm. Let's get that pork blood up in here. No, thank you. Pat. I didn't eat that much of growing up. I don't even like it. I don't get it. I think it's so good, but I was like sad to eat it. Like I was so scared to bring it to school because people would be like, I wouldn't want to explain that I was like just eating pork blood. You know what I'm saying? But now I'm <laughs> super proud. I'm like, whatever. It's so good. Chocolate meat. You should make a t-shirt that says chocolate meat. <laughs> we gotta put my rice. It's on a nice bed of rice over here. Yeah. I, I love like explaining to like people who don't eat rice. Like people are like, why is there so much rice? And it's like, it's it's I don't know, I can't explain it. It's like important. It's like the important part. It's like the most important part of the food. Yeah. It's like when people are like like twelve glasses of water, like eight glasses of water a day. I'm like, no, eight cups of rice a day. Am I right, ladies? Let's go for <laughs> our, our roll is up in here. <laughs> My question was like, how did we how did like we survive eating so like three heavy meals a day? Like I don't know how that happened. That was like a lot of food. It's a lot of food, Angel. It is. It is a lot. That's okay. Eight cups of rice. It's a little much, but you know, rice pudding. You can rice and <laughs> soup. Rice with pasta. I know when I would try to like make pastas for dinner, my dad would be like, "Where's the rice?" And so I'd also have to make rice, and then he'd like mix it together. It's like we did that. We totally did that too. Um, we we um. I remember one time we even ate, had like a, um, what was it? Like one of those like Costco lasagnas and then, um, and then we had our side of rice with it. It's so weird. Yes. So Malika, I want to share what you have. Yeah. Um, I wrote, I love when my mom made her beef machado. That was her true specialty. The beef was so tender and the sabao was so good with rice. And that's my perfect bite right here right there. Uh, I'm like that emoji that has like the drool coming out of its mouth because it's so hungry. Yes, yeah, so hungry. 
What did you draw? I drew just a big, <laughs> big aerial view of the new one. Close up. Yes. Oh my God. I'm so color I'm so enjoying this. I need it. No, okay. I can't. I can't. That's like my one food that I like need to get. I just recently liked sea fig. Like it took me a while to get there. That's so funny. Ooh, so what's gonna be on page six? Oh yeah. Are you gonna introduce that? Or am I doing that? Am I doing that? Oh yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, how do you bring your Filipino heritage into your life today? Um, what is it that you do in your daily life that feels the most um, Filipino to you? It's a hard question. It's, right? it's, it's hard for us to answer. How do I bring heritage into my daily my daily life? Hmm. My daily life. Oh. It's so easy to cop out and say food, but like, do you really eat Filipino food every day now? It's like not really. Daily life. Oh, I think I know what I'm gonna do, but it's gonna be like I'm gonna try to draw it, see if it makes sense. I'm just gonna, mm -hmm. gonna go for oh, it. Oh, I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Yeah. I know what I'm gonna write. Um, so I, one thing that my family has is that everything is just like, they, they're, they exaggerate so much. Like my mom often says like, you gotta try this orange. This is the best orange you'll ever taste. It's like everything is like so hyped up and so amped. Um, and I feel like I, my personality is the same way. So I would say that probably the biggest thing in my daily life that feels Filipino is how I live life with gusto, which is such a big theme in in um, in my family. Just like live live your best life and like live big. And I feel like I'm always so animated and everything is so exciting. So I think that's like probably the most Filipino thing about my personality. That's so cute. It truly is like, oh my God. I'd love to see your answers in the chat too. What what um Yeah. I put like <laughs> the Filipino like lip thing. Like in this drawing, I'm trying to tell my partner to turn the light on just using my mouth. Like <laughs> <laughs> like great. I did it one time. I didn't even realize I was doing it, and he was like, "Are you doing that lip thing?" And I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> oh, okay. okay, we should um, probably move on to the next page. Oh. So the next page is what languages Hello. does your family speak, and do you speak them? And what are your favorite words? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, and I cannot wait to see your zines, like with the hashtag, hashtag craft in Quentuhan. Um, there we go. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm so excited to see the finished zines. These share super well on social media too. If you um, share on Instagram as a gallery, um, you can get them, just like take a picture of each spread, and they're just like, so one, two, three, four, five, that they just like share really well on social media. So yeah, I can't wait to see yours. Um, all right, so the question is like, what's 
quickly. Yeah, I forgot one. Okay. speaks Tagalog and I can understand when they are talking shit. My favorite <laughs> words are badui, which means cheesy or lame, kawawa, which means sad, pobrecita, which means kawawa, and lawai, drool. Did you finish yours yet, Angel? I want to see yours. Yeah, so my mom and dad talk to each other in Tagalog. And my mom talks to my grandma in Cebuano, but they only talk to me in English. So I only know a few phrases. But here, let's learn one today. I don't know how to spell it, but it has something to do with a spear. And my dad says it every time he like leaves the house. Hmm. And it's called Sibatnako, which means kind of like see you later, but it's kind of like you throw a spear and it's like disappearing and that's kind of like I'm leaving like a spear. You know what I'm saying? Wow, so that's, that's really cool. Yeah, that's what he says when I leave when he leaves the house. So I asked him the other day, I'm like, what does that literally mean? And he's like, Yeah, it means like, you know, see but not go. Like you're throwing a spear, it's going away, and I'm going away too. That's so interesting. I would love like a whole history on that. That's so awesome. <laughs> And we're all, we're literally at our last page right now. This is so crazy. We're done. We're like, just, just, um, honestly, open your zine and see your finished work. It's amazing. Like you can mm -hmm. just photocopy this and like give it to a bunch of people and that's it. Um, yeah, so charge dollars. Yep. Charge people seven, yeah. A hundred dollars. Angel, you're doing our last question, I think. All right. The last question is. What's your favorite part about being Filipino? Ooh. Yeah. Um, yes. I know exactly what. And share in the chat too if you want.
So, um, <laughs> I think I'm almost done with my page. If you have extra time to, on um, if you finished your page, you can go back to the other pages and like finish up and add details that you didn't get to do. I know it's not very much time um, between each page, but really the point is that we wanted you to have a sense that yes, you can create art in a very short amount of time. You don't really need that much time to like make art. It can be something really quick and rough and dirty and that's totally fine too, you know? It doesn't have to be like a big grand opus. Um, so my page says, my favorite part about being Filipino um, is how excited Filipinos are when they meet other Filipinos. And it's me meeting someone and saying, oh my God. And that's basically the story of being Filipino when you're away from your family. That's so cute. What did you, what did you draw? Oh my gosh. Well, I drew us. No! That's so cute. I love the way like our community is always just try to have these kinds of gatherings and come together. So thank you so much, Theo, for bringing us together. Thank you, Manny, for doing the behind the scenes work. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm just like so excited to be able to be part of events like this and to see like yeah. other, you know, Philams and other friends, you know, I know some of my non Philam friends are also here. I'm just so happy to be like in community with everybody. So yeah, making art together. This was so fun. This was really great. So don't forget to um, thank you again to Manny and Theo for host and the Smithsonian for it, like yeah. for hosting us this amazing series. Um, I hope you enjoyed making your own personal zine. Um, again, you can unfold it, photocopy it, and give it out to your friends and family. And uh, post this on social media. We want to see it. Use the hashtag. We will we'll be sharing it and retweeting it. And I just want to see like a timeline of like beautiful zines and hear your stories as well. And we'll pick somebody at random this week to win one of our signed books too. Um, so with that, thank you. Yay.